So yeah, over the next 40 minutes or so, I'm going to talk a bit about my some of the research that we're doing at Harper Adams, but also a bit of a broader overview around uh, alert systems for farmers. There's going to be a focus on dairy cows, in part because I think that's the, the sort of the, the sector that's leading the way, uh, and it's something that might come up in the discussion, I think, later on as to to what extent might these approaches be used in the other sectors, the other livestock sectors. Uh, but in terms of what we're going to look at, I'll talk a bit about precision livestock farming in general, uh, not wanting to steal too much of Nick's thunder later on today. Talk about how, in terms of behaviour monitoring, it really started with estrus alerts. Then go on to talk about health alerts. So this is the, the, the exciting developments at the moment with precision livestock farming around health alerts with the potential of disease diagnosis coming maybe not too far away. Talk a bit about a, cu a couple of sort of future technologies, animal positioning, vision-based systems. Talk a bit about a future application for the data for these technologies in terms of welfare alerts and assurance. We're going to have the barriers to adoption in the discussion. Uh, I've got a slide on that uh, before coming to a sort of bit of a summary. So really, precision farming, uh, the idea is that we can gather and process information to improve the precision of resource management. So that's pretty much the textbook definition. It really started in the arable sector, and the idea is that rather than just apply a standard flat rate of fertilizer across the field, you can monitor the crop growth. You might actually look at yield one year and use that to target fertilizer the following year, you can take the same approach with herbicides, the same approach with pesticides. So it's about the more targeted use of resources. And it's exactly the same principle when applied to livestock that is now known as this field of precision livestock farming. So really following the Second World War, we intensified livestock production. This was largely done at the group level, but actually precision livestock farming is, is changing this. And it's much more now about gathering data from individual animals so we can actually manage them as individuals, so we can target our resources. It involves much closer monitoring, closer control of where the animals are, what they're doing, increased use of robotics. Uh, and the main focus on the talk will be looking at the dairy sector, because this is where we've seen the greatest initial uptake. And I think there's two reasons for this. First of all, we've got this killer application of artificial insemination. We'll talk about that in a moment. But also, it's easier to get a return on the investment from a technology just due to the value of milk over the lifetime of a cow. And that's going to be more challenging with, in beef, even more challenging in sheep. But I think some of the approaches that I'll, I'll be talking about can actually apply to, can be applied to these other sectors. So uh, with arable farming, the global navigation satellite system, things like GPS, is very much the backbone, actually working out where you are in the field. And arguably, the, key, the core technology within precision livestock farming is electronic identification. So this allows us to actually identify individuals. If we're going to manage animals as individuals, we need to identify them. Uh, and radio frequency uh, ID tags, so we've all been given one for some reason. I don't know if, if something's going to happen with that, but we've all got our RFID tags. Uh, those are what are actually uh, identifying individual animals. Typically, as an ear tag, they can also be given as a, uh, as a, as a bolus. So, estrus alerts, why did it really start around estrus, precision livestock farming? And this is really in terms of behaviour monitoring. So, certainly things like milk recording, recording yields started really before uh, the, t the technology was used for estrus alerts. But when it comes to behaviour, which is my sort of main field, uh, really it all started around estrus alerts. Uh, and the key thing is, estrus is, hopefully I'm, people in the audience, you know, <laughs> I don't need to tell you this, but just to make sure you appreciate that you only get milk from a cow when she has a calf, she needs to get pregnant in order for to have a calf, and you need to inseminate it at the right time in order to get that to happen. So if you miss that window of opportunity, you're going to keep her for 21 days, feeding her, no, no production. Uh, if you get the timing wrong, and she doesn't actually get pregnant uh, when you have inseminated her, you've, you've lost the cost of that potentially quite expensive straw of semen. So even, you know, clearly disease is very important. Sick cows still produce some milk. If you don't get your cows pregnant, they're not producing any milk. So what happens to a cow when uh, she goes into estrus? Well, I suspect cows spend most of their time thinking about food, but then that changes, and they're more interested in trying to find a mate. And we see some uh, changes in behavior associated with estrus, so we see this increase in activity, uh, a big change in activity, so anywhere between 2.3 and 4 times uh, uh, an increase in activity. 
Uh, now, this is predominantly in-housed cows. I'll talk about the, some of the challenges in doing this with cows at pasture in a moment. But this is where the first technologies were developed, simple pedometers, later on accelerometers, to pick up that change in activity. We also, though, see changes in terms of her feeding behavior. So uh, on the day of estrus, again, this is the, the best definition of estrus, is if you inseminate a cow on that day and she gets pregnant, she must have been in estrus on that day. So this particular study done by Halley uh, picked up that uh, we see a drop in visits to feeders, we see a 10% drop in uh, uh, intake, 20% drop in time spent feeding, so actually we can infer from that that intake, uh, intake rate increases, so that she must be eating more quickly. But we also get these changes in feeding behaviour. But the first sort of behaviour that was targeted with these estrus detection system was that increase in activity. So we're going to look at that over the next few slides. And it was these simple pedometers, they would simply count the number of steps that the animal was taking to give you a sort of basic activity level was where it started. But then no doubt many of you have got a smartphone, probably quite a few of you have got a smart watch. The chips, the accelerometers that were developed for those really brought down the cost of this sort of technology. Uh, and it now means that these can be fitted into effectively almost a Fitbit for a cow. So that's the Ice Robotics iCube you can see at the bottom there. So these, rather than just give you a basic measure of activity, will tell you how many steps the cow's taking. Uh, which will tell us when she's lying, when she's standing, so we can actually get a much more detailed measure of the cow's changes, the changes in her uh, locomotion behaviour over the course of the day. Now we can also put accelerometers on other parts of the cow, and depending where we put the accelerometer on the cow, we'll pretty much determine what behaviours we're picking up. So if the accelerometer goes in the cow's ear, we can pick up rumination, we can pick up eating, we can pick up general activity. Uh, I've highlighted the colours here to show where there's research to indicate which, which behaviours are best from particular sensors. So actually an ear-mounted uh, accelerometer, very good at picking up rumination, not quite so good at, uh, at, at uh, eating. If it's neck-mounted, it's good for eating, not quite so good for rumination. Both can pick up activity. If it's leg-mounted, it's pretty good for all of the measures, and we've done some of the research that sort of shows that. Uh, you can also put an accelerometer in a room in bolus, and again, it will pick up uh, activity. But it's important to mention that, again, you can put these accelerometers in different places. They'll pick up different behaviours. Uh, but this just shows with an ear-mounted accelerometer. So when we look at resting, for example, uh, we've got pretty good concordance, 97% concordance between manual observation and the automated system, pretty good for ruminating, not quite so good for eating, and actually activity pretty poor. So again, it does vary depending uh, on the positioning of the accelerometer, just how good it is at picking up particular behaviours. So we can pick up uh, these changes in, in activity, quite easy to do in housed cows, because they're generally not that active when they're feeding, they tend to stand at the feed barrier, stationary. In a grazing situation, you've got cows that are out at pasture spending eight hours to 12 hours a day grazing, very active. So it's more difficult to use changes in activity to detect cows in estrus when they're out at pasture. So the traditional approach has been to use uh, something like a KMAR, a, something that really shows you that a cow has, has, has been mounted. This goes on the, the animal's rump. Uh, now at the moment, or till a few years ago, it, you, it was manual observation that detected when there'd been any changes there. But uh, three or four years ago, I was in New Zealand, and they've actually now got a camera system that's actually reading these things automatically as the cows come through the parlour. So we can actually use a combination of perhaps some of these traditional approaches with those KMARs with some sort of automated uh, sensors, as, as, as we can see here. Now, arguably, the best detector of a, of a cow that's uh, in heat is, of course, a bull. <laughs> and we can use bulls as well. So I think this is quite a nice piece of technology. Uh, I haven't actually seen it in practice. This is just a photograph from one of the, the dairy events a couple of years ago. So what you do is you, it's crucial you need a vasectomized bull. So you need a bull who's interested in cows that are in, in estrus, but crucially he shouldn't be uh, inseminating them himself because you want to use, all you're trying to do is detect when they're in estrus so you can hopefully improve the genetics using uh, through artificial insemination. So the idea is this, this collar has within it a, an RFID receiver. So that ear tag that's on the cow, that's actually picking up effectively how long is he spending with a particular cow or cows. 
And again, they've developed the algorithms that help flag up the fact that this bull is now spending more time, this particular cow, and that's how you can then actually uh, pick up that hopefully she's in estrus. And again, this is very much designed for working with cows at pasture. So again, we have these range of technologies for picking up in these changes in activity, or again, some slightly more novel approaches for picking up changes in behaviour uh, that are using uh, things like a bull when cows are out at pasture. So just to go back to the slide, we had this slide a couple of minutes ago. Uh, we talked about these changes in feeding. So can we also use these to help detect when cows are in estrus? Uh, and yes, sure enough, this has been used as one of, the, as, as one of these estrus detection technologies. The challenge, though, is, is actually picking up when are, when are cows feeding, what, are, what is the intake that we're getting from those cows. So when you put an accelerometer on a cow, uh, you can actually sort of measure her movements. But actually, when she's foraging, we get lots of fairly complicated behaviours. We've got a combination of bites, chews, and things called chew bites. Uh, if they're at a feed face, the animal's head is moving quite a lot. When uh, they're out at pasture, their, their body is moving as well. So the, any, any accelerometer signals we get from, uh, from cows that are feeding are actually very complicated and can be quite difficult to interpret. In contrast, when they're ruminating, cows are generally stationary. They're either laid down or they're standing still. And they're simply performing one type of jaw movement. So you have a really pretty obvious signal that you can try and detect when cows are ruminating. So this is why I think that the technologies that were developed in terms of, of, of looking for those changes in feeding associated with estrus, uh, they actually targeted rumination. Rumination is very closely linked to fibre intake, so minutes ruminating, closely, closely related to how much fibre the, the cow has ingested. So I think the dairy tech companies really went for this, this easy option rather than trying to detect uh, foraging behaviour they actually looked at rumination behaviour. So unfortunately, no longer uh, uh, being used, but the SCL vocal tag, this used a, uh, a microphone to pick up uh, effectively the sound. It could hear when the cow was uh, ruminating, the very regular sound when she's ruminating. Uh, but an ear-mounted tag is also good at picking up rumination. Uh, if you can't see the animal's jaws, their ears wag. So when the cow's ruminating, her ears are gently wagging, you can pick that up with the... Uh, with the accelerometer. Right, let's move on to talk a bit about health alerts. So it's perhaps not surprising that these technologies that were really designed to detect behaviour changes associated with estrus, they can also pick up changes in behaviour associated with injury and disease. It's perhaps not also surprising that something, uh, a sensor that goes on to the animal's legs, such as the, this is the latest genera uh, generation of the uh, ICE Robotics uh, iCube, uh, is actually very sensitive to any changes in the animal's gait and is very good for picking up really the very earliest signs of lameness. So we worked on a project uh, with ICE Robotics. Uh, we were locomotion scoring cows. They were developing the algorithms. So again, there's a lot of commercial IP involved in this, uh, so I can't share too much of the information. Uh, suffice to say that we helped them. We effectively supplied all of the, the data they used to train their system, and then we actually helped them validate it, and we think it's a very reliable system. There was one point when it was actually picking up, we were getting lots of false positives, uh, but then the vet that was working on one of the farms actually got a thermal imaging camera out, and sure enough, those animals that were false positive, there was some sign, a uh, slight increase in temperature within the foot, suggesting there was something there. So you can actually pick up really subtle changes. And again, I think this is the real challenge with health monitoring. Uh, uh, Estrus, we see big changes in behaviour. If we're going to detect changes in behaviour associated with disease. We want to do that as soon, the very first signs that we get that the animal is sick. So we're going to need fairly sensitive systems in order to do that. So we can look at other animal-mounted sensors. We've run through the accelerometer-based ones. Uh, and again, this is really important to think having potentially more than one sensor on an animal if we're going to pick up these very subtle changes at the very earliest stages of a disease. So uh, the ear-mounted sensors can pick up the animal's uh, body temperature. We can have neck-mounted systems giving us location. I'll talk a bit about that uh, later on. Uh, or something like the, uh, a rumen bolus will give us uh, body temperature, rumen pH, and drinking. So let's just look at a couple of these uh, in turn. So these rumen sensors, again, they can have an accelerometer in for picking up changes in behavior associated with estrus. They've got a, a temperature sensor in there, so you'll be able to pick up sort of changes in core body temperature. 
uh, in terms of disease detection, but it also can pick up drinking. So particularly on a day like today, when you've got really cold water in a water trough, but most days the, the, you know, the water's going to be somewhat below the temp body temperature, you can pick up a drop in temperature within the rumen uh, to indicate when the cow has, has, has been drinking. The, uh, these devices can also have pH sensors on them. The challenge there, though, is that uh, pH sensor is, ex is very expensive. The rumen are a very challenging environment, and they've actually got a comparatively short life. But there is some discussion about, well, could you use them as sort of sentinel cows? Would you have maybe just one or two cows with a uh, rumen pH bolus? But something like the SmackStack bolus will actually give you a sort of range of measures. So we focus pretty much on animal-mounted sensors. There are other devices, though. So you can have uh, external sensors, fixed sensors. So something uh, like the gait analysis system. So when cows walk over this, it's looking at the, uh, at the animal's gait. Uh, or uh, vision, 3D systems, uh, 3D vision systems. And I'll talk more in general about vision a little bit later on. Uh, but this video just illustrates the body condition scoring camera from De La Valle. So this is the, uh, effectively the sort of the normal uh, camera view, black and white. But here you can see it's sort of been color coded with the 3D information. Uh, and this can actually give you, uh, uh, pretty much every time the cow comes under, you will get a body condition score. So you can actually track body condition score over time. So I think we've already got uh, things like lameness alerts. Uh, and I think the next thing is, can we actually use these sensors to pick up behavior changes associated with other diseases? So we did a study. Uh, this was actually part of the uh, project we did like with Ice Robotics. Uh, we did have quite a few cows at Harper Adams with, that had become naturally infected with Yonis disease. Uh, so we were sort of tracking cows, and when they first started to transition, when they first started to show, well, actually, they didn't show any clinical signs, but when they were testing positive with milk ELISA test, uh, we were comparing the behavior of those cows with cows that were negative. So not the best ideal study, but the fact we picked up some differences shows that clearly you know, there must be something in this. So we have published this in the Journal of Dairy Science. But what we picked up is that those cows that were uh, really just about to start showing the clinical signs that, were, that had these two positive milk ELISA tests, the JD5 cows, they actually spent less time lying down. But when they did lie down, the bouts were longer. Uh, now, so what's going on? So this sounds slightly counterintuitive. You'd think when you're sick, what do you tend to do? You go to bed, you'd think lying time would increase. And as we'll see in a moment, that's the case with quite a few diseases. But in these early stages with Yonis disease, uh, what we've actually shown is what they're, what they're actually doing is spending more time feeding. So this is when uh, the, uh, it's a gut disease or it infects the gut. So we're starting to see an increase in the passage rate. So the cows are trying to compensate by spending more time eating. But actually, the longer bouts are also quite interesting. We think what's going on there is there are probably the cows are possibly feeling some discomfort uh, in, 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 in their gut. Uh, and actually, getting up and down maybe exacerbates that. So this is possibly why they're spending a little bit longer lying down. But have we got, is, is this a unique signature to Yonis disease? So we're just going to plot a table with a few different values on here. So again, we've got this increase in standing, decrease in lying. We've got lying back duration going up, though. So again, an interesting uh, a particular sort of combination of things here that we think might be unique to Yonis. And we did see an increase in feeding duration. So we haven't actually done much to study this yet. It's something that I would like to do. But a couple of years ago, there was a review by a group in Germany, uh, Dietrich et al., and they did a literature review looking at behavior changes associated with a range of different diseases. And we've just listed all of the parameters down the side here. So I'm not going to go through this in detail. Uh, however, uh, it's worth pointing out that feed intake is actually quite difficult to measure on farm at the moment. So we can measure feeding time, but actually knowing how much they've eaten not something you'll be able to measure on farm. But I think these other measures, you could, you could actually use commercial sensors to pick up most of these other, uh, other parameters. But then also, we look at the results from different papers. And there are some conflicts within the literature. So one study showed that with hypercalcemia, we saw an increase in standing. Uh, another study showed an increase in lying. So those two are pretty much uh, mutually exclusive. So again, uh, I suspect where we are going to need to, we're going to need, going to need to develop algorithms that will obviously have other factors influencing this. There must have been some 
uh, sort of confounding factor or something, some, some, some other factor that's influencing this. Uh, but similarly, we will say, for, for example, ketosis, we've got some studies reporting an increase, some a decrease in, in standing, uh, and similarly when feeding in terms of mastitis. So I think we've still got some work to do, and you can see there's an awful lot of gaps in here, and I think we need to better understand what these other factors, what factors influence these various things. So again, ice robotics are very keen to, to look at sort of lying duration to try and better understand how lying is, 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 is impacted on by a variety of factors. One of those will be, uh, or part of that is disease, and maybe again we can start to tease these things apart. So again, I think there's, uh, I think this, hopefully over the next maybe five years or so, we'll see some progress in, in developing diagnostics based on these uh, uh, differential behaviour changes across different diseases. Right, so just talk a bit about some uh, sort of future technologies, talk a bit about animal positioning and vision-based systems. Uh, we're actually going to go back in time, though, in terms of positioning. So just as a brief interlude, I thought I would just share with you. I put some slides together for a talk a couple of weeks ago, so I thought I'd just sort of put these in. Just to illustrate that GPS, the global positioning system, uh, has been used to track animals. This was a project that uh, I led back in 1993, uh, and it was really trying to work out why was it that a few sheep up in Cumbria had very high levels of radiocesium. So the idea was if we could track where the sheep are, what they're grazing. Are they grazing in a hot spot? Are they eating a plant that's selectively concentrating the radiocesium? But it was, as far as we're aware, the very first project in the world to use GPS to track a domestic animal. So you couldn't actually go out and buy a nice package device. We had to work with a company called uh, Industrial Development Banger. Uh, this was then a state-of-the-art memory card, two megabytes. Yes, that is megabytes. <laughs> so I was amazed you could get two megabytes on something that small. You know, that you'd, you'd be getting terabytes now on something that sort of size. Uh, but that was a two megabyte card that would record the data. Uh, this is a very young me. <laughs> uh, with the equipment, you can see it was actually quite bulky, just to fit in terms of having the batteries, because uh, GPS then and now requires quite a lot of power. Here we are setting it up, and here it is on the uh, uh, back of a U. Here she is going out to pasture, and here she is. Uh, so of the three sheep, two of them very quickly adapted to, to wearing the equipment. It, was, it looks really heavy uh, and bulky, so it is bulky, but it wasn't actually that heavy. It was only about two kilos. Uh, but as I mentioned, battery life was then and still is a challenge in terms of, of, of tracking animals. So although we might use this technology in uh, extensive systems, uh, we still have this challenge to overcome around really getting regular position fixes uh, in terms of actually monitoring what these animals are doing. But this just illustrates the data. So we've got three sheep illustrated in, in different colours showing as these three sort of separate uh, grazing locations over a 24-hour uh, period. So because GPS is so power-hungry and because it would be useful to know the positions of cows, a couple of, well, I think three or four companies now have actually developed tracking systems designed to work uh, indoors with cattle. Uh, so these are not using GPS. This is a sort of a, uh, a sort of fairly common misunderstanding. What they're using is radio triangulation. So rather than have a GPS receiver that's having to extract a very weak signal from a lot of noise and then do some quite complicated processing to work out where the animal is, you effectively use radio tracking. So this is just, uh, it's giving out a coded, uh, a sort of an identifiable signal. And then you're, you've got receivers in the building and you can use time of flight to triangulate to where the cow is uh, in, the, in the barn. So quite a, 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 a novel system. Uh, certainly held up lots of promise in terms of being able to tell us a lot about what the animals are doing. Because uh, in theory, they can also tell you whether the animal's lying or standing, if you've, if you've got that precision. But perhaps not surprisingly, when you do this in a metal frame building, you've got lots of infrastructure there that's causing problems in terms of, of acquiring those signals, in terms of reflections, refractions, things like that. So the precision is generally not actually that good. So one of the systems, Smartbow, was bought up by Zoetis. They've quietly withdrawn it from the market now, I think in part because they were a bit disappointed with, with the results they were getting. Uh, this is the NADAP system. So I'm also a visiting professor at Haas den Bosch University in the Netherlands. So Lenny van Erp has been doing some studies looking at this with a few students. Uh, and actually, the precision, the, the amount of noise you get at any, any point in time, can be quite large. 
So in terms of actually looking at interactions between cows, exactly where cows are, you know, these are giving us some, uh, this sort of, this approach is actually giving us some problems. So again, it's disappointing that it hasn't actually quite lived up to the early hopes. Uh, so the next thing that we've all got our hopes pinned on is computer-based vision. So no doubt many of you might be aware, lots of applications for computer-based vision. So Tesla has their uh, camera-based autopilot, so it'll happily drive you on the motorway. You have to tell it when to change lanes, things like that, but it'll, it'll drive you along, take you through the exits and things. Uh, and ultimately, they're aiming to make this as a, uh, effectively a self-driving robo-taxi. So when you consider how complicated that task is, possibly identifying cows, what they're doing, uh, hopefully we think might be a bit easier. So we have got a project we're currently working on with Peacock Technology. So the idea is we've got cameras mounted in the barn, uh, pretty much giving us a full view of every square inch of the area that the cows are, uh, where they're located. Uh, the algorithm can, first of all, as we'll see in a moment, identify that, well, there's a cow. It can then identify the individual cow. So conveniently, our Holstein Frisians are color-coded, but they actually believe that it's using a, not just the patterning, but also sort of the shape of the cow. Because clearly, if you've got some, occasionally you get pretty much all black cows within a, within a, within a group. Uh, so it's actually sort of using the, the shape of the cow to identify individuals. And the next stage that we're just about to start is can we actually now train the system to identify when the cows are eating, when they're drinking, when they're lying? Can we pick up rumination? Is it sensitive enough to pick up rumination? Can we pick up estrus behaviours and social behaviour? So I'm going to talk about social behaviour in a moment, but I think this is a, uh, there are some exciting opportunities around being able to look at social interactions in cows and think about, well, what might that tell us? And then ultimately, they're going to want this system to generate management alerts to the farmer. So it's sort of moving away from the idea of having a sensor on every cow to having sensors in the building, uh, cameras in the building that are just watching what the cows are doing. So this just shows you these, these haven't been processed. These are just the raw images uh, showing you, I don't know how many cameras there are there, but here's cameras just going down the feed passage in, in, a, in one of the farms that we're uh, piloting this on. This shows you the image from one camera, and it actually shows you where the algorithm has, has gone around and has actually put a box around each cow. So this is what it identifies as a cow. So it's, it's already identifying cows. Uh, and this is what it's actually doing is it's now got a confidence interval, uh, sorry, confidence level. So this is, it's 88% certain that this is not only a cow, but a particular cow uh, and, and sort of so on. So it's actually able to identify uh, individual cows in the barn. It's continuous, it's real time, so it's actually tracking what they're doing 24-7 uh, and again has the potential, I think, to, to give us lots of uh, very useful information. So again, we can identify and label the cows and we're just starting to work on trying to train it to identify the behaviours. So I think this is something that we might see over the next four or five years as a, as a commercial technology on, uh, on dairy farms. So I mentioned social behaviour, so I think... Cows are social animals. I think uh, being better able to understand the herd social network, I think, could be really useful. It's an area where, to be honest, the science hasn't quite caught up with where the technology is now. So when we observe social behavior, we're really looking at, at very close interactions. So here we've got a nice affiliative, positive interaction, this cow grooming this other cow. We can identify that, but I suspect you know, cows, uh, a subordinate cow, if it sees a dominant cow or an aggressive cow, is probably moving out of the way long before they actually come together. So if we could actually track the cows, we could try and investigate this social network. And I suspect the social network will probably change when a cow is sick, when she's in, injured, or uh, when she's got uh, estrus. So we've got another behavior here we can feed into our, sort of de our detection algorithms, our diagnosis algorithms. But also we know cows have friends, so often, Heifers that are introduced into a herd together, uh, they will often stay as a group together. You'll see them sort of lying down alongside each other. So potentially managing them as friends. Can we keep them? Can we manage their reproduction so that they're kept as a group? I also suspect that there are aggressive cows. So this is not the dominant cow. This is an aggressive cow. Social dominance evolved to try and reduce aggression. But I think we might have accidentally selected for aggression in our cows when we were selecting for milk yield, because we've selected for high intake. And to get a high intake, you're looking at cows that are pushing into the feed face. So can we identify aggressive cows? Uh, and could this be a, a breeding criteria? Could we maybe try and select 
aggression out. And again, there's the old adage, you can't manage what you can't measure. So is social behavior something that we're going to be able to actually both measure and manage in the future? So I think this could be quite an exciting opportunity that could arise from sort of reliable precision, uh, sorry, reliable uh, position systems uh, and potentially our vision system. Right, so the final thing I'm going to talk about are welfare alerts and could we use the data to underpin sort of farm assurance in terms of animal welfare. So no doubt many of you are familiar with the Farm Animal uh, Welfare Committees, Five Freedoms. So this is a framework for assessing animal welfare. So you've got freedom from hunger and thirst, freedom from discomfort, freedom from pain, injury or disease, freedom to express normal behaviour, freedom from fear and distress. So I've really just put this in to illustrate that uh, you know, th there are lots of different factors that contribute towards animal welfare. Uh, and if anything, it's getting more complicated. So Five Freedoms came out uh, in the sort of 19, late 70s, early 80s. Uh, about 10 years ago, the Welfare Quality Programme uh, sort of refined from Five Freedoms down to four principles, but then introduced 12 criteria. So I'm not going to list them all, but we've gone from effectively the five freedoms to 12 criteria. Most recently, uh, uh, David Meller's group uh, have come up with this five domains model. So they've gone back to five overall factors, nutrition, environment, health and behaviour. But within that, they've identified 118 separate factors that all contribute towards animal welfare. Now, you don't need to measure all of those, but... It clearly illustrates that animal welfare is a very complicated phenomenon and actually uh, there's lots of things that sort of contribute towards it. And this is why it's, it's been impossible really to identify a simple iceberg indicator. There was a lot of hope a few years ago, well, if we can just measure this one thing, that'll tell us all we need to know about the animal's welfare. But as we've seen, lots of factors contribute towards animal welfare. And current sort of farm assurance schemes, things like the welfare quality, really at the moment rely on farm visits, uh, so these are very time-consuming, comparatively infrequent. Uh, they are just a snapshot. If it's a good day, farmer might be lucky. They happen to visit on a good day. It might be unlucky. It might be a day when his relief milker didn't turn up or there's some other problems. Uh, and it relies very heavily on resource-based measures. So, for example, how do you measure freedom from thirst? You actually count the number of water troughs. You, you're not using any, any measures of drinking behaviour. So the idea is, can we actually use the sensor data? Can we incorporate that? Uh, so the idea is you would have uh, your animal, so this just shows you a range of different sensors. So we're not saying at the moment that you'd need all of these sensors on an individual animal, but as we'll see, actually, the more sensors you have, then the more, potentially the more reliable, the more uh, precise we're going to get in terms, of a, uh, in, in terms of an overall welfare assessment. So it's a combination of things like the leg sensor, neck sensor, room and bolus, an ear-mounted sensor, but also things like a static camera giving us body condition score. So that data is already sitting in cloud servers across a number of different companies, giving us things like body condition, uh, position, rumination, uh, whether the animal's eating or not, her body temperature, whether she's been drinking, things like lying uh, steps and lameness. So what we need to do is actually is to take the data from these different uh, cloud systems and have one overall integrating system. So this might be part of a particular assurance scheme. So this one is based on the five freedoms. So we've got hunger and thirst, discomfort, pain, injury, disease, normal behavior, and fear and distress. So the idea is we can then actually map the different conditions onto the, uh, these uh, different welfare criteria. So body condition, for example, is relevant to hunger and thirst. If the animal's using con losing condition, she's going to be hungry. Uh, but also, it's possibly a sign that she's, uh, uh, that she's got a disease. Position and rumination covers quite a lot of them. Ease of movement. Uh, again, we're going to see changes in rumination uh, and uh, movements associated with, uh, with injury and disease. Because we've got a couple of behaviours there, we can look at normal behaviours. And again, we might even, with position, look at things like uh, the uh, aggression and flight. Is the animal having to run away from, from other cows? Uh, eating feeds into hunger and thirst and normal behaviour. Are we getting normal patterns of eating? Body temperature, drinking will feed into hunger and thirst, pain, injury and disease, into normal behaviour. And then we've also got lying, uh, uh, the number of steps she's taking in lameness. Again, coming into things like discomfort, 
Can we pick up lameness? Are we getting normal patterns of behaviour? And again, are we seeing changes in terms of steps associated perhaps with flight, with, with, uh, some, with, with the animals fighting? So we can see here how we've got a, uh, we can potentially use the sensor data to actually underpin uh, welfare assessment. So we're no longer relying on an infrequent farm visit. We're using real-time, 24-7 data to actually monitor what's going on and actually feed this information into the system. So that could generate alerts to the farmer. It could say, look, we've picked up, there's a, there's a problem in terms of animal welfare. Obviously, this is information that could be shared through the supply chain. That just gives you an overall view of the various interconnectors. Uh, so you could actually then use this to generate an overall assessment. So is this something that might feed into a labelling scheme uh, in the future? But actually, we've got lots and lots of data sitting in here. So I think we could almost take it one step further. Because one of the current challenges with these assurance schemes is, if we just go back one, we've got these five different factors. How do you weight them? How do you decide how important is normal behaviour con compared with pain, injury and disease? How important is it compared with the discomfort? There's no scientific way to determine those. It's effectively a value judgement. It's an objective, uh, sorry, a subjective decision. So at the moment, the weightings are really decided by a panel of experts. But we sort of know from some of the published literature that uh, consumers often have different ideas about what they would want to prioritise in terms of uh, animal welfare. Now, that may be sort of formed from a position they may not be fully aware of all of the issues, and you may be arguing, well, the experts know best. But you know, we have got the option here of, of, of saying, well, perhaps you know, different people can actually come up with a few different... Uh, weightings. And then also, what is your incentive to improve welfare beyond uh, some sort of acceptable threshold value? So it's a bit like washing machines. You buy a washing machine now and they're all A++++++. Everyone got to A and then you had to sort of keep extending it. Uh, if you do have a fixed system, you know, what incentives are there once you sort of reach the uh, threshold? So the argument is, and I don't know whether this would work, this is just an idea I'm sort of throwing out uh, in terms of actually you know, really trying to get the most from the data, trying to add value to it. It's, is this something that you might want to share with consumers? So it might not be all farmers do this. A farmer who's really proud of the welfare standards on their farm might want to say, right, I really want to demonstrate the very high standards because I want to charge a premium for this, so I want to be able to, to have some way of doing that. So the idea is that uh, you can actually have an app on a, on a smartphone, or well, probably more realistically, it would be part of a smart shopping assistant that actually uses uh, the, uh, uh, the customer's own weightings, and they can set an acceptability level. So how would it work? We have the data sitting in the, uh, uh, the farm assurance system database. And the idea is you would then, in the app, you would set your priorities. You can't set them all to 100. If you try and move on to 100, they all go to zero. So this is just showing how you might want to set your particular weightings. And then I, for this particular example, I only want to uh, buy a product that comes from the top 25% of farms across my particular weightings. Uh, and in theory, it should be able to interrogate all of the data. Uh, that's all integrated. You then scan a product and it tells you whether or not it meets your criteria, your individual criteria, and it recommends one that possibly does. So would consumers engage with this? I don't know, but I think it's a possible way that we can also look to add value is by sharing this data through the supply chain to really make sure we, we're getting the, the full value out of it and to demonstrate the very high standards of welfare. I think possibly important with Brexit and the fact we're now having to compete more uh, at, at an international level, having this information I think could be, could be really important in the future. So I won't really say too much about barriers to adoption other than to say I've identified 12 of them. So we might come back to this in the discussion. <laughs> But I have got a couple of minutes, so there are a number of pre-purchase barriers, uh, and rural internet is certainly one of them. Uh, and then we've got some post-purchase barriers, and I think an important one that's already been identified is that farmers don't particularly want to know that a cow's rumination has changed. They want to know what it means. They want relevant information, uh, and we need to make sure that the, the technology don't uh, interfere with each other. We need to make sure that we get the staff on board, that they uh, don't want to think they're going to lose their job. Uh, and again, we need to make sure that, that they've got support. But we might come revisit this a little bit later. So just in terms of a summary, 
So in terms of behavior monitoring on farms, it all started with estrus alerts. Uh, we're looking at, we've got big changes in behavior with estrus. They're relatively, relatively easy to detect with a single sensor. And you'll get a return on your investment from that one sensor, and these have been available for a while. Health alerts, more challenging, because we're looking for subtle changes now, especially if you want to pick up disease changes as soon as possible. Uh, diagnosis is likely to require more than one sensor per animal because we've got a number of different factors we want to look at. But ideally, and th there is a caveat which I'm going to talk about in a moment, uh, potentially we can add value. We can say these come from very high welfare herd. We can hopefully reduce veterinary costs. So the idea is that the extra sensor will hopefully justify, uh, can be justified by those savings. And I think this is, we, we're already seeing this, uh, and this is something that's going to increase, I think, over the next five years. And then just looking to the future, I think we will get welfare alerts. Again, this is multi, welfare is multifactorial by definition. Uh, we've got a lot more parameters that we need if we're going to get reliable alerts. So we, we're going to need either more sensors, and again, this is in a five to ten year time scale, or this caveat is these vision-based systems may allow us to actually collect lots and lots of information that's actually relevant and actually allow us to not only deliver reliable health alerts, but also welfare alerts. So that's 41 minutes. I ran a minute over. Sorry, Chair. <laughs> so that's hopefully giving you a bit of an overview of the, the work we've been involved in and sort of where I sort of see things going over the next maybe five to ten years. And I think we've got a f uh, time for a few clarification questions. We, we, we have, Mark, and thank you very much. Precision timing, absolutely. So uh, well done indeed. Now, look, I've got a few questions here, but if anybody has a question in the audience, would they uh, please stick their hand up and I'll try and come to them. Now, it is important that Sean is going to wave a microphone in front of your mouth um, so you speak into it. That's so that everybody who's out there uh, online can actually hear it. So uh, don't uh, I ignore the, the, the microphone. Um, and she'll wipe it down between people, I think, in a very um, uh, COVID-sensitive way. So there's a, there's a question over here uh, with Phil, Sean. If we could hear from uh, Phil... And then we've got a few more I've got here for you, uh, Mark, in a minute. So, Phil. Yeah, testing, one, two, three. Yes, um, On your barriers to adoption, Mark, you invited suggestions of things you might not have covered. Um, I appreciate you've covered a, a wide range of different technologies and complexities and so on, but what would be, what would be a typical payback period of the capital investment involved? And what would be the typical say, five-year return on that investment? You, unfortunately, I, the, the short answer is I don't know. Uh, one of the great things about working in a university is, is you work as a team. So my colleague, Carl Behrendt, who's an agritech economics professor, would probably be able to answer that. What I would like to do is draw your attention to one of them, though, which is in here somewhere, I think, or maybe it's not. But actually, it's this idea that you move away from it being a capital investment, and it actually becomes a service. So it's like a smartphone. So actually, I do buy my own smartphones, but most people, you, you effectively rent the smartphone from, 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 the, from the telecoms company. And a lot of companies are moving to that model. So Ice Robotics do that. You pay per cow per month. Uh, you don't own the system, but the alerts that are generated, those are then shared with you. So I think there's two things. One, that overcomes that capital investment barrier. I think you know, there's probably some minimum contract, but it overcomes the need to get that capital investment. Uh, and then, sort of secondly, it also it really tries to make sure it's in the company's interest, and it's, I think it was this last point here, that they've got to support you, got to continue supporting you, because I think it's been all too common in the past. A good salesman comes along, they sell some hardware, the farmer pays quite a lot of money, it all gets installed, and then they don't get the support. And also the other fear is that the tech will become obsolete. It's known as the Betamax effect, for those of us old enough in the audience to remember. There used to be two formats in the good old days when we used to record television onto magnetic tape. Uh, you don't, you know, are you buying into something that's going to go obsolete? So again, if that's a big capital investment, that's more of a risk. So I think that maybe answers part of your question, actually, that that I think the, the, the companies are moving to this more to this subscription model. In terms of return on investment, how long does it take? Uh, again, I know Carl has done some work. I can't remember the exact figures. Ironically, the better the farm, the longer the return on investment because they're already pretty good at managing their animals. But also, it, does it depends the, you know, how, how much are you really using the information, how much are you using the data. 
I think it's certainly been demonstrated that you know these estrus detection technologies are pretty good, and they would they pay for themselves effectively. Mark, we might perhaps come on to pharma behaviour uh, yeah. in our, in our yes. discussion in a minute because I think you've actually hit on a, a critical factor there. But I uh, sort of had a follow-on from Phil's. I mean, uh, as an agricultural student from the 1980s, so that shows my age, that was pre-video, actually. Um, I remember carving intervals of 365 days, and that was considered to be the norm. Now, we've moved yeah. a long way from yeah. that. The, thinking particularly about the e Easter stuff, which is probably the things that have been in circulation uh, the longest now, how much of a benefit do you think we are seeing from that e Easter detection technology? How much has carving interval, which as a farmer is something yeah, I yeah. can really get my head around, yeah. how much has that improved over recent years, do you think? I, I, I think the challenge, as we've improved cow genetics, and again, as we've been selecting for yield, I'm trying to think one of my PhD students I co-supervised was, was looking at this, the problem is the duration of estrus has decreased. <laughs> so mm. we've accidentally selected for cows that have got a shorter duration estrus and they're not expressing it as much. And I think that's one of the reasons why we've seen carving interval increase, because we've, we've moved to, uh, you know, and the technology is maybe, that's one of the risks with the technology is, is it sort of covering up other issues around management and, and other problems? Yeah. And it's a bit of a first aid. So had it not been there, somebody would have said, well, hang on a minute, we've got to go back to the genetics and we need to think about mm. this. Can we not select now for the expression of estrus to make sure we actually, you know, we can actually pick this up? Oh, there's Sean. Yeah, another question at the back. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, you mentioned um, that this is very dairy dominated as being the leading sector. Um, in terms of some of the sheep world, and one of the technologies, um, and it struck me up there, was the imaging uh, and looking at the body condition score. Um, so in the sheep world, that's becoming quite an important KPI, you know, the body condition. And there's lots of people out there busy calibrating different farmers to do that kind of by hand. Do you think the technology could be used for the sheep and the wool factor, you know, I, the, you know the complications wool, of wool? Yeah, wool, wool will be a problem. Uh, now, whether there is a sensor, I know, you know, you can get, you, there must be some, I don't know if it's LIDAR or, you know, you can get imaging things that will effectively see through the vegetation canopy to the ground. So could you get something that could actually look at, look at what's going on in terms of confirmation? So there might be something there. Uh, what we have been doing, and I didn't really have time to cover it, is using drones as platforms for in a more extensive system. So can we have camera systems on drones identifying sheep, uh, possibly not using, not being able to identify individuals on their appearance, but maybe using medium range EID so you could actually monitor and, 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 and track sheep. So I think... I think EID, obviously, you know, that's cheap enough. Well, it's now mandated for, for, for ruminant livestock. So, you know, what technologies can we build on, on top of that? Uh, and I think there might be other, other approaches. Uh, but again, the, the challenge, I think, is seeing that return on the investment with, with, with beef and sheep. Because with dairy, you do have the value of the milk over the lifetime of a cow. And I think it's going to be health monitoring and it's going to be welfare assessment that might pay for that. Well, and also the fact that it'll probably be part of your ELMS system that you need to prove that your sheep are grazing in particular areas at particular times of year as part of your agro-environmental scheme and that it's the data that actually, you know, that, that actually results in DEFRA giving you the money, possibly. I don't know. So, so I think there's going to have to be different approaches with, with beef and sheep and it's going to be quite a challenge. The, um, as, as a director of an abattoir business, and we've been trialling VIA carcass uh, classification within the abattoir, so having taken the wool off it, um, and uh, the observation would be that the degree of tolerance is just not acceptable, when it, particularly when it comes to paying the farmer on the basis of it mm. at the end of it. I wonder, actually, in what we're dealing with here in trying to help us make you know, better, more timely uh, decisions about our animal health and welfare, we should not be too obsessed with the absolute granularity no. which we're trying to get in the carcass classification in the abattoir, but we're looking at things in a, you know, in a, in a sort of wider perspective. I do sometimes wonder that actually we, you know, from a science point of view, get driven to trying to get to the ultimate result when we, we perhaps should be thinking about things with a wider degree of tolerance. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's a good. I think that's a good point. Um, we have another question here, just whilst Sean goes to Ian, there, there is one that's come in here which I, I've jotted down, which is about the social behaviours, Mark, that you were talking about. And um, 
If one accepts that, I'll try and pracy this, but the, there's a, an unnatural environment that is the barn, um, ha have the cows evolved to that unnatural uh, environment and the behaviours changed accordingly, or have we got to wait another million years for the cows' <laughs> evolution to catch up? So I think they, they have... Uh, <laughs> They've sort of, I mean, it's, it's been selection. So there's been a process of natural selection to some extent with traits that are compatible with domestication. And when you actually look at the animals that we've domesticated, uh, you know, the, it's these artiodactyls, it's the ruminants are actually figuring there because they've got things like social behaviours that are compatible with being in groups, things like this. But I don't think you have to scratch too far beneath the surface to get back to the ancestral cow. And unfortunately, we can't look at them because the last aurochs, wild aurochs, the ancestor of modern cows, was killed in a forest in what's now Poland in 1670 or something. <laughs> so we can study things like domestic chickens. And what we know from the chicken, actually, is you know, they, they show a lot of the traits, and pigs, they show a lot of the traits of, of their wild ancestors. But it's that adaptability that allows them to live well in captivity, uh, but there's still a social network within, within the cows, and you only have to observe cows to sort of see that. When, you know, when they stop being inquisitive about you and you just watch the cows, you will see you know, these social interactions. And I think we've done a good job at reducing the stress in the life of a dairy cow. We've managed to improve health and welfare. But actually, I think one of the biggest stresses now for lots of cows are other cows that are actually just being aggressive to them. And I think that's something that if we can look at, uh, and again, this is, it's just based purely on observation, no science, no scientific study to support this, but based on years and years of observation, it's not the dominant cow, it doesn't say to the dominant cow that's the aggressive one, it's the, the middle manager. There are cows in the middle of the hierarchy who want to be dominant, who are going around giving grief to any other cow that they can find. Not all of the time, but just every now and again. Uh, and I think if we could identify those cows, we could sell them. Uh, but actually, could we use that as a, as a, you know, something for for breeding as a breeding goal in the future? Could we actually select for docile, more docile cows? Because I think we might have, just as we've accidentally selected for a, a short expression of estrus, I think we've also selected for cows that are good at pushing in at the feed face in terms of, of getting yield. So, so I think social behaviour is for me, you know, it's a fascinating new area. We've not really been able to study it in in the detail that's needed. We have now got the tools. You're right, as a scientist, I'm probably going to focus in on getting the nth degree. But actually, I think there could be really useful information there for the farmer in, in the future, potentially. Ian, you have a question. Yeah, I suppose just thinking about which of those welfare conditions and what's the mix um, and the social one probably being an interesting one, where we've seen real success with both farmer and supply chain adoption is where there's sort of that direct KPI for the farmer in terms of milk yield. And when you're talking about sort of going down the supply chain, I look at those five things and go, okay, well, firstly, let's think about what's the direct impact on yield. And I wonder with them that we start to get diminishing returns anyway on be it milk yield or beef for, you know, weight gain and so on. Have you done much in terms of thinking about if, what is that mix to actually get optimised productivity without going into sort of bad welfare? I mean, I think, I think if, if you get it right, you can get the win-win-win. So, I, you know, we've, what we've demonstrated with a lot of our pasture preference work is actually giving... The cows, giving cows what they want, understand what they need, give them what they want. You can actually make your system more productive because you have got happier cows. So we've demonstrated in terms of pasture access, giving cows access to pasture. So they've got a TMR inside, so they're not relying on grazing for their nutrition. TMR inside, but they can go and lie down outside. We've got increased lying times. We also got, uh, it was 10% you know, more milk out of those cows. They ate a little bit of grass, but you know, a lot of that, uh, that increase in production was actually supported by just providing with, with, with what they want. So there are win-win-wins out there. You know, I think, and I think a lot of farmers now do understand that, that actually welfare, I think welfare was saying, oh, this is something that's going to cost me. I have to give these cows all of these things that are going to have a negative impact on production. If we do it right, it shouldn't. Right. You mentioned needs and wants, Mark, and I want a coffee. <laughs> so that's uh, actually an essential part of welfare. What we're going to do, we're going to have a quick five-minute coffee break. It's ad-lib the coffee for the conference. Can I suggest you're back here literally uh, at 22, just over five minutes. We'll have a quick walk around, grab a coffee, come back.